200 years ago, there were as many as 250 million ponds scattered across North America. This animal turned dry valleys into lush oases, kept the soil from cracking, and nourished entire flocks of migrating birds. But then people came, and within just a few generations, it was all gone. Today, as those same lands grow barren, a controversial idea has been proposed, bringing back the ecological engineers to the places they once ruled. Some believe this could be the key to fighting drought and wildfire. But can thousands of small freshwater creatures really rescue the parched deserts of the American West? And what difference could they truly make? The outcome of this gamble has shocked the world with the sheer ambition of the United States. So, in the end, is this a miracle? or a dangerous experiment? Let's find out. One, the natural landscape. Before the West became desert. Before vast deserts stretched across the American West, the land looked very different. The Colorado River, the Rio Grande, and countless tributaries wound their way through hot valleys, leaving green ribbons along their banks. In many places, willows, aspens, and cottonwoods grew thick, casting shade across the water. That fragile ecosystem survived on rare rains, but it was held in balance by one remarkable creature, the beaver. From Canada and Alaska all the way down to northern Mexico, beavers once covered the continent. The journals of the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 19th century tell how they constantly had to break apart beaver dams just to move along Missouri's streams, sometimes finding dozens of dams across short stretches of water. Naturalist Ernest Thompson Seton estimated that before the fur trade exploded, the number of beaver ponds in North America may have reached 250 million, a staggering figure compared to today. These ponds worked like natural reservoirs, slowing the current, holding sediment, and quietly recharging the groundwater below. Modern satellite images compared with historical records reveal a stark contrast. Where wetlands once spread wide, built by beavers, there are now only dry creeks and gravel beds. Hydrological studies estimate that roughly 9% of the continental United States was once wetland, much of it created by beaver activity. These systems didn't just sustain fish, but also provided for migratory birds, amphibians, and countless small mammals. In other words, one rodent built an entire web of life across half a continent. But that balance was fragile. By the 17th century, waves of European settlers brought an insatiable demand for fur, and beavers were hunted relentlessly. In just over two centuries, their population was driven almost to extinction. Their pelts turned into fashionable hats in London and Paris, or exported for medicines and perfumes. By 1900, only about 100,000 beavers remained in the entire United States, less than 1% of their former numbers. When they disappeared, the consequences were immediate. Streams that once flowed gently became violent in the rainy season and bone dry in the summer. Floodplains vanished, rivers carved deep scars into the land, and the landscape itself bore the wounds. Without the quiet work of these ecological engineers, the natural rhythm of the West began to unravel. In the 20th century, America tried to replace nature with concrete. Giant dams like Hoover Dam in 1936 and Glen Canyon Dam in 1966 stood as monuments of engineering power, bringing electricity and irrigation to entire regions. Yet at the same time, they cut off sediment flows, blocked fish migrations, and left rivers unnaturally still. Ecosystems that once pulsed with the beat of flowing water grew weaker. The result was a paradox. Cities flourished thanks to artificial water, but just beyond their edges, the land grew parched, rivers shrank, and long droughts turned vast parts of the West into thirsty desert. And it was on this backdrop when concrete dams proved powerless against climate change that a seemingly wild idea emerged, bringing back the beaver, a creature built for rivers and ponds, into the driest corners of America. Two, human intervention. As the American West entered years of severe drought, 
The great reservoirs sank lower, farmland fed by irrigation canals turned pale and unproductive, and scientists began to face a bitter paradox. Mankind had once wiped out the very animal that could have helped them hold on to water. The idea of bringing the beaver back began quietly. In the early 1980 seconds, a team of ecologists in Utah persuaded local authorities to let them try. They made no grand promises, only that beavers might help hold water and bring the land back to life. When 47 beavers were released into the Price and San Rafael rivers, few believed that these slow-moving creatures could change anything. Yet in the very first year, young willows began sprouting along the new pools of water, and the current softened. In Nevada, the comeback of the beaver was even more natural. Without human help, they crept back into Susie Creek a little stream that had been nothing but gravel. Within 20 years, it transformed into a ribbon of green, migrating birds gathered, ducks splashed, salmon returned to spawn. Local ranchers were astonished to find their pastures staying moist longer and their cattle drinking even through the hot, dry months. Satellite images taken before and after forced scientists to admit just a few families of beavers were enough to green hundreds of acres. California's challenge was different. Here, the danger was not only water, but fire. After 2020, when raging wildfires turned the state into a red inferno, officials were forced to search for new answers, and they remembered the beaver. In 2017, Dry Ravine Reserve, a parched canyon lined with dead trees, was chosen for reintroduction. At first, the place looked hopeless. Stagnant puddles, brittle grass under a blazing sundae. But within a few years, ponds appeared, willows grew thick and green, and flocks of waterbirds landed. When fire season came, those oases stopped the flames and saved patches of living forest. By 2022, California announced another round of beaver reintroduction, this time not as a trial, but as an official policy declaring them allies in the fight against climate change. Few know that experiments with beaver relocation date back even further. In the 1,000, 940 seconds, in the remote valleys of Idaho where no roads reached, conservation officials devised a bold plan, strapping beavers into special wooden crates and parachuting them from planes. More than 70 years later, that black and white footage is still replayed as proof of the daring and creativity of ecologists determined to restore nature by any means. By the 2000s, projects became more organized. In Washington, the Methow Beaver Project, launched in 2008 and lasting until 2015, reintroduced more than 300 beavers into the Eastern Cascades. The results went beyond expectations. Young salmon survived, the hot summers, groundwater rose, and green corridors spread across the valleys. This project is often cited as one of America's most successful examples of nature-based solutions. From scattered trials, the idea quickly grew into a trend. The Department of the Interior and the U.S. Forest Service began funding projects under the banner of nature-based solutions. At conferences, the phrase Beavers Free Water Engineers was repeated again and again, both as a political slogan and as a defense of this new approach. A California state senator once declared, if we have to choose between spending millions on concrete levees and letting beavers work for free, I know what I'd choose. But not everyone was convinced. For many farmers, the memory of fields flooded by beaver dams was still raw. To irrigation engineers, the very idea of handing water management over to rodents sounded like mockery. And for the communities living next to the release sites, the question lingered. Was this a miracle or just another experiment with nature as the pawn. While politicians praised the beaver as an ecological engineer, the people living nearby began to see the other side, and soon unexpected consequences appeared. 3. Unforeseen Consequences When the beavers began building dams, many believed they had found the green cure for the dry lands. But nature rarely follows the script humans write, and those little constructions soon revealed their hidden costs. In Utah, just a few years after the first trials, sections of traditional irrigation canals were blocked. Water meant for hayfields spilled over, drowning the very land it was meant to nourish. In 2018, Idaho recorded an incident in which more than 120 hectares of farmland were flooded when a beaver dam diverted the canal. 
To farmers, the beaver was no longer the ecological engineer, celebrated by researchers, but a destroyer of crops in a single night. Some lost entire harvests, and local farm associations filed petitions demanding state compensation. Their argument was simple. If the government brought the beavers back, then the government should also pay for the damage they caused. Elsewhere, the new ponds brought a quieter but troubling risk. Mosquitoes. Still water, floating weeds, and thick aquatic plants created ideal breeding grounds for Aedes, the mosquito that carries West Nile virus. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported more than 2,000 cases of West Nile in 2021 alone, concentrated in the Southwest, exactly where many beaver reintroductions had taken place. Scientists hesitated to claim a direct link, but in those communities, people whispered, it's the ponds that bring the mosquitoes. A local paper in Campo, Arizona went so far as to call the beaver a plague with fur, a biting piece of sarcasm. And in Arizona and Nevada, another problem surfaced. Summer heat there can reach 118 degrees Fahrenheit, far beyond what beavers from northern forests could endure. Some failed to build dams, found no shade, and died within weeks. Images of beaver carcasses dried stiff along the barren streams raised an unsettling question. Were they being sent into lands that would never belong to them? All these consequences came with real costs. A Utah State report in 2019 estimated that dredging irrigation canals blocked by beaver dams had cost more than $1 million in just five years. In Idaho, the irrigation company reported spending about $200,000 annually just to repair beaver-related damage. With tight budgets, many communities saw this as an unfair burden, especially since they had never been consulted before the reintroduction projects began. These outcomes exposed yet another paradox. The very animal hailed as savior could also be a threat. Beaver ponds held water in the soil, but at the same time disrupted the man-made irrigation systems farmers relied on. They helped forests resist fire, yet stirred fears of disease. And when the climate grew too harsh, the beavers themselves became victims of the experiment. The result was a growing divide. Rural residents asked who would pay when their crops were lost. Scientists defended the long-term benefits, and federal agencies, though still promoting beavers as a natural solution, were forced to face the truth. The experiment was more complicated and far more conflicted than anyone had imagined. Small beaver dams had set off ripples. No one expected ripples that spread beyond a single valley, reaching into economics, public health, and the fragile balance of the environment itself. Four. A chain of consequences. At first glance, a beaver dam is nothing more than a few branches, wedged across a stream, a ridge of packed mud hardly worth noticing. Yet from these small constructions, a chain of changes no one expected begins to ripple outward. The first impact was seen in farming. In places where beavers returned, dry brittle pastures turned green again, cattle had water to drink, grazing fields filled with tender grass, and to many ranchers, it felt like a priceless gift. But at the same time, a single dam built too high could break an irrigation canal. Water no longer flowed as people intended, but as the rodents directed it. Farmers who relied on precise daily schedules now faced the risk of losing their crops overnight as sudden floods swept across their land. In Idaho, such floods became undeniable proof. One beaver pond could ruin an entire year's harvest plant. As the pond spread, another creature quietly benefited the mosquito. In the shade of willows, on mats of green algae, they multiplied in swarms. At night, when families sat outside on their porches, the buzzing grew thick, almost haunting. The fear of disease became real. The CDC reported thousands of West Nile cases across the Southwest. And while there was no absolute proof that beaver ponds were the source, locals whispered that it was the dams that brought the mosquitoes, and the unease alone was enough to unsettle entire communities. Beneath the surface, even deeper changes unfolded. When beavers blocked the streams, more water seeped into the ground, replenishing valleys, reviving trees, and moistening soil. But farther downstream, flows dwindled faster. Geologists in Arizona documented unusual drops in groundwater levels in certain basins right after reintroduction projects began. 
The simplest image was that of a fragile blanket of water now pulled unevenly, covering some places warmly, leaving others exposed and bare. These effects did not stand alone, but connected like falling dominoes. Crop loss led to economic disputes, mosquitoes brought public health concerns, and changes in groundwater threatened entire communities reliant on shallow wells. A beaver dam could save one corner of a valley, yet upset the balance elsewhere. And this was the paradox many hesitated to admit. The beaver could be both savior and source of disorder. When a small animal suddenly carried the burden of replacing an entire irrigation system, one troubling question rose to the surface. Did humans truly understand what they had set in motion, or had we allowed one natural link to pull down an entire chain whose end we could not foresee? 5. Nature-Based Solutions even with the controversies, many scientists continued to see the beaver as a natural solution worth patience, because the mechanism it created was unlike anything man-made. When beavers built dams, the flow slowed, but did not stop. Water seeped through layers of mud, down into the groundwater, then emerged, again, downstream at a gentler pace. In this way, the system acted like a giant sponge holding and releasing, allowing soil and water to blend in rhythm with nature. At Susie Creek in Nevada, researchers tracked the changes over two decades. Before the beavers returned, the creek was a shallow trickle sliding over gravel. But after more than 130 dams appeared, green acreage expanded by more than 100 acres, groundwater rose, and the dry season no longer cracked the valley floor. Satellite images comparing 1,985 and 2,010 showed a vivid green ribbon exactly where once had been deadland. Another example came from Idaho after the sharp fire of 2023. Around the beaver ponds, patches of green survived, while neighboring valleys were consumed by flames. Scientists realized that the moisture held by beaver wetlands kept nearby plants from igniting as fiercely. These wet spots became natural firebreaks, slowing the advance of the flames. In an age when climate change drives wildfires faster and farther, the beaver suddenly looked like an unlikely ally. The economics were also hard to ignore. A cost study compared building artificial beaver dams, human-made replicas with concrete levees. Restoring a mile of stream with the imitation technique cost about $10,000, while concrete levees could run up to one and a half million. The gap was so wide that some politicians began calling beavers the free laborers of America's water system, even if farmers frowned at the metaphor. From an ecological view, beavers have been called the kidneys of rivers, filtering water, settling sediment, and creating habitat for dozens of other species. In Washington, the Methow Beaver Project reintroduced more than 300 beavers since 2008. And within just a few years, survival rates for young salmon rose noticeably thanks to beaver ponds that kept water temperatures stable. All of this showed one truth. While concrete dams are rigid, beavers are flexible, constantly adjusting their structures to match water levels and seasons. That adaptability makes them a natural solution humans can hardly replicate. Yet, success does not mean perfection. A system dependent on wild animals will always carry risks. And so, the debate among scientists is not whether to use beavers, but how much, where, and under what limits. 6. An unanswered question. From dry creeks turned to green ribbons, to pastures suddenly flooded, from valleys saved from fire to communities anxious about mosquitoes, the beaver has shown it can bring both miracles and troubles, all from a single dam. And America, thirsty for solutions in the face of climate change, has chosen to put its trust in an animal once driven to near extinction by human hands. But one question has never been fully answered. Is this truly an ecological strategy, or just a risky experiment dressed as a natural solution? When thousands of beavers are placed in arid lands, is the United States really trying to heal deserts, or is there another motive hidden from view? And if one day these dams tip the balance too far, who will bear the cost? Viewers may see new oases as proof of hope, or they may see them as warnings that no intervention comes without a price. In the end, are beavers, our allies, or merely pawns in a much larger game we have yet to fully understand? The answer, perhaps, is still unwritten.